Hello everyone, welcome to this CUBE Conversations. I'm John Furrier here in our Palo Alto studios. This is the CUBE, CUBE Signal program here with Grant Fondo, partner at Goodwin, um, CUBE alum I've been on before. Thanks for coming back in. Good to be back. Uh, partner at Goodwin, one of the best law firms around ICOs and just corporate governance. He's a, a security guru, regulatory guru. Um, we've talked in the past, there's a YouTube video up there. Check it out, search for Grant Fondo. You'll find our previous interview with laying out the ICO playbook. Uh, update, let's get the update to the playbook. So ICOs, kind of in a winter state now, but still <laughs> ICOs going on. Signal announced massive uh, traction with their ICO. Um, they're going to do an insider, kind of private sale, looks like, and then open it up. They got millions of people, so that's interesting. But then ICO stabilized, you got to see them in the 20 million range. What's this, the current update from the ICO front? So I think in the U.S. the current update is sort of post-Munchie. So there was a SEC enforcement action and then Commissioner Clayton made certain statements about ICOs. And then the net net on that is I think it has provided greater clarity about issuing utility tokens in the U.S. Clayton's statement essentially was that the, they really haven't, the SEC really hasn't seen any, any utility tokens that are really utility tokens. The Munchie decision emphasized that in some regard. So with the Munchie decision, some of the things that they focused on was that the marketing of the token, even though they essentially, the SEC assumed that the token was, was a utility, had t tremendous utility essentially on the platform. But what the SEC did was took, looked past that and said, okay, what's the practical reality of that? And so what they focused on, they focused on was the marketing. So how is that company marketing the token? Are they selling to people just to use it on the platform? Or are they selling it much more broadly to investor, kind of crypto investors, VCs, that type of thing? Also, there were some certain marketing statements where the company was actually trying to uh, drive up their, emphasize that the price of the token would go up in value. They also focused on the fact that it was going to be on an exchange. And so what they, what they said was, listen, this token is not, is not a pure utility token. What it is is a token for people to buy with the idea and hope and expectation that it will go up in profit. So they basically, the Munchie decision was targeting guys who were throwing everything at the wall. They were, they seemed to be. <laughs> Yeah, so it's funny. I think I think that's a little bit of a misinterpretation. So there's clearly there were statements in there <laughs> that you sort of shake your head a little bit. Um, but I think that misses the picture of the Munchie decision if you focus on, oh well, we won't make those those sort of statements. You need to look at and focus on also what were the other underpinnings of that that enforcement action. What was the message combined message with that with the July 25th guidance that they issued, mm -hmm. and then Clayton's statements. And I think the message is that. Yeah. Utility tokens are going to be a tough road in the U.S. going yeah. forward. They certainly have not identified what a, a valid utility token would look like. So I think it's, yeah. um, it's, it's a little bit of, they've created greater clarity, but yeah. also a lot of uncertainty as well. I was having a conversation with some friends and we were talking about ICOs. Also, you know, we're bullish on ICOs. And, but you know, the conversation turned towards you know, two, two bipolar positions. Man, this is a crypto so awesome, blockchain, innovation, take down the incumbent, decentralized apps, this is the future. And then the other side, from very smart people is, man, that's fraud, don't associate yourself with ICOs. So there's a little bit of a wolf of Wall Street, wolf of ICO kind of mentality going on when they see the pink sheets, the old over-the-counter uh, mm -hmm. market that they made the movie Wolf of Wall Street around. People are nervous around, about that. I'm not saying that's happening, but there's a, there's a vibe there. What's your reaction to that? I'm sure you might have conversations about the same kind of reaction. Yeah, my reaction is, is this is a sea change and it's going to happen and it's happening and I equate it to the internet in many ways. And so I think you have to go in eyes wide open. I think you have to understand the regulatory risks if you're a company doing it. You know, there's, there's not a certain path to do it in the U.S. and you have yeah. to evaluate that. There's, you can go offshore and there's certain paths that way. But as someone who's potentially going to purchase tokens or digital currency, and I, I sort of separate them between yeah. like the Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is more digital currency, and then tokens, yeah. which are some of the ones we've been talking about. Close to 1,400 so, now out there. I would, just, I would <laughs> assume there's even more at this point. <laughs> so uh, they're really popping up every day. And I think you have to, like the internet, I think there'll be winners and losers. They'll probably end up being more losers yeah. than winners. I think the regulatory environment will get more certain. Um, and then there's going to be, and that's fine, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you have to go eyes wide open and you may lose your money in it. And then there's the category of pure fraud. And so that, it, there's always, whenever there's an opportunity, the criminals come jumping in and, or people take advantage of a situation where yeah. maybe they would not have otherwise. And that's going to be a portion of it too, but I yeah. think you can get a pretty good read on some of these, whether this sounds like pretty sketchy or not, and you just have to be realistic about it. And you guys are doing a good job, the, the, the practitioner community is really working hard. I mean, I always say, my, my feeling on this, we've talked about this before, is that the internet bubble was a bubble, 
but everything played out. You had to buy pet food online. You get mm -hmm. stuff delivered to your home. So I think the same thing's happening with ICU. I think the things that are coming out that's innovative will end up happening. The question is the compressed nature of how fast forward this bubble is. I mean, you look at the NASDAQ growth uh, during the dot-com bubble stage yeah. and look at the crypto market, total market cap. It's so fast forward, it's happening faster than even the dot-com bubble. How do you keep up? I mean, what, what's your day like? I mean, you go through research notes. I mean, yeah. you're talking to clients. I mean, it's a it's, fire hose. Yeah, it is, but it's, it's a great time to be a lawyer in this space too. So a lot of it's dealing with clients and trying to figure out how do we deal with the regulatory situation, advising them, connecting with uh, foreign counsel as well, dealing, there's been some enforcement activity both on the state and federal level, so I'm dealing with that as well, advising them through that process. So it's, I mean, it's a fun time to be a crypto lawyer um, and an ICO lawyer. Um, and I think too that you are, what, what is also part of that you're seeing here that's fun and interesting is that the, the, regardless of how you feel about ICOs, one of the great benefits of it is you have all these different companies that otherwise would have never thought about using the blockchain or hadn't focused on it. And they're suddenly using the blockchain in this, this technology. So you've mentioned about how fast forward it's going, how quickly mm -hmm. things. I think these have accelerated this change and this disruption by five to 10 years. And I think mm -hmm. that's an enormous impact that is a positive impact. And so no matter what happens with the, the coins that you buy or may not buy, that's going to be a change that's going to be with us going forward. Talk about the regulatory uh, update. There's obviously concerns and, and whether you're investing in crypto or investing as, a, as an individual or fund or as an entrepreneur trying to build a business. Mm -hmm. What are the regulatory things that are, people should be aware of now that's different than before or, or that's more maybe more prominent? How would, how would you talk about the regulatory? So I think there's a couple of buckets. So one is if you're the company doing the ICO, you've got to address whether that token is a security. I think the SEC has said we've, most of them are, you know, or all of them are securities. So you have to deal with that reality. If you're trying to crypt, create a cryptocurrency, you have to look at our, are we going to be registered by FinCEN? And so I think you need to assess those. I think if you are part of the ecosystem helping any of these sales, is, so let's say that you're the, doing the marketing for, the, for one of these token sales, or you're an advisor who's trying to bring in other investors or things of that nature. You have to look at per, what's called participant liability under the SC, SEC rules. And so you have to be aware of what you're doing, whether does that create exposure to you or your company if that token end up, ends up being um, unlicensed security. Likewise, if you're an exchange moving these tokens or facilitating the sale of these transactions, you now have to think about, am I, should I be registered with FinCEN? Should I be registered with the SEC? So those are really kind of issues, core issues yeah. that you have to deal with. And then as an investor, I think generally investors would be viewed as the victim by these regulatory agencies. So I don't know that there's real exposure from a liability or litigation perspective, but I do think it's more, again, like doing the due diligence and, and eyes wide open and, and understanding that if it fails, you may not you may yeah, not have yeah. any recourse. And so everyone wants their tokens to go up. That seems to be the trend. Um, let's parse through the concept of utility and security we did. But now I have, I have a token out there, I'm ICO, and I plan to take an ICO or I'm ICO. What's the role of exchanges in all this? Because good tokens should have you know, liquidity. People should be exchanging tokens. Some people hold the tokens or hoard them. But the role of an exchange, do I plug with an exchange? Do I do my own exchange? What's some of the law around that? Because you know, if I'm an ICO candidate, I'm like, hey, I'm going to launch my token. It's going to be a secondary token, but I'm going to run my own exchange. And of course, list my token on the big exchange so people can trade it and the price will go up. Yeah, so, that, so, <laughs> so that's, gonna, that's a natural <laughs> reaction. So that sounds, that to the SEC is going to sound like a security. So one of the things you have to address is if you're going to do this in the US or bring in US money, is I think it's a real risk to put the tokens up on it. Is exchange. there hybrid models? Because I, I can see a utility vehicle saying, hey, what a utility, like the arcade example we used before, but what good is a token if the price doesn't go up, right? So say that utility doesn't go fast enough and all this arbitrage, can I do a hybrid utility and security? I think it's hard. I mean, it depends on, on how it's structured. I mean, one way to do, uh, potentially to do a hybrid, and this has not been tested as far as with the utility token, but the SEC has, um, sanctioned is not right, the, the right word, but it said what's called passive bulletin boards are not securities exchanges. So that's in the context, imagine you essentially say, here's a platform for people, buyers and sellers of our token to exchange it between each other. We're not in the middle. We're not taking any 
transaction fees. And so there's a path to that. Now that may not be attractive to certain ICO companies, but that is a potential path where you can provide liquidity. So like a Craigslist or like a bulletin Craigslist. board, the old school, you know, bulletin board days. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, people still use them. They so still use the burden that, bulletin board? Yeah. yeah. Canoes, yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah. and so that, that's Social a Social network? That, yeah, that's a path to do it. You can also, if you do create a system where the token does not leave the exchange, excuse me, leave your platform, so it's a closed loop uh, token, that's a pa potential path that you can do. Again, it may, it may inhibit. So there's solutions for, the, for people who need to have some sort of interaction between token holders. Yes. Without going pure exchange in the sense of you know, trading and having a market cap and all that stuff. Yes, I think it's many, Clients would say that it's less attractive from a marketing perspective, yeah. um, but but there are there are potential paths. There's also the, the path that we're seeing more and more, which is securities tokens. I think when you and I met last time, we had just started touching on that. But I think that explain is, what's the the big change. So the concept is is the securities token is you're basically going to treat it like you are going to treat it as security. You're going to own it, and you're going to go to the SEC and get it registered through like a Reg A plus, which is essentially is a 50 million or less raise. Um, that's sort of a common one we're seeing. And so in that context, you are saying it's a token, but it's a security. You don't have to give up equity. There's other ways to do it. So you can give up a percentage of the revenue, sort of treat it like a dividend. And, and that way it's a regulated entity and you're not taking that risk about are we a utility token or not. Hmm, that's a good path and that makes sense depending on, on the uh, ICO. Okay, let's talk about bounties. Um, as you know, we're, we love bounties, love the concept of bounties. Um, you know, media business would call promotion, spiff, channel partner, whatever. Mm -hmm. People use promotional incentives. Bounties are popular, you're seeing bug bounties in open source being used. Um, try to get Kelsey, to, Kelsey kind of addressed a little bit, but it's, it's more of a, a legal thing now. What's the status of bounties? You mentioned uh, before we came on, that gets the SEC's attention. Uh, so the bounty is <laughs> so if the bounty is designed to sell the token. So you're you're in your fundraise round, for example, and you put out a bounty so that people will go sell the tokens. I think it creates issues with the SEC. Part of it is it's very hard to control that bounty. So you're going to have people who are trying to make money selling your token, and they are potentially going to make statements that are going to indicate that or make statements the SEC is not going to like. Yeah. So I, you know, it's something we or promises to basically sell the deal, broker dealer almost, right? Correct, so there's a couple of issues, not only from the company perspective, that you've got somebody out there who's probably marketing your token in a way that the SEC is not going to like, uh, and so that creates potential exposure, but also from the, the bounty person, the person doing the bounty, there's potential exposure, but are they essentially doing a, a broker, or are they acting as a broker dealer or other type of seller of unregistered securities as a participant, for example? And so I, I, it's not something we generally recommend to our clients. That said, if you are going like more of a true utility tout, there's nothing wrong with like a reseller agreement. So you could structure something. I mean, most of these bounties tend to be like, hey, if you bring us X amount of token sales, we'll just give you something. There's no real strong contractual arrangement. But if you are a company that has traditional resellers and, you're, and the purpose of, this, of the sale of these tokens is for that customer to use it on your platform, I think you can structure things so you have reseller agreements. So it's really case dependent. If you're Very using bounties that arbitrage to sell the deal versus actually part of your business model, this, that's kind of where you look at it. Kind that, of yeah, I mean, yes. I think, I think that's a distinction, that, and I think that's a distinction, no guarantees, but I think the SEC would understand. I mean, yeah. it's all part of it, they're looking at the picture. Yeah. Are, are you trying to just make this token go up in value, or is this token really supposed to be used on your platform? All right, so uh, question for you. Since we last talked, I think it might have been two months ago, maybe it's been 60 days or so, I can't remember the actual, when we came in last, it seemed like uh, yesterday. What's, what's changed? What have you learned? What's new? Uh, what surprised you? Um, what's interesting that's happened over the past few months? So I, I don't think any of the regulatory action has surprised me. I think we, <laughs> we sort of knew that was probably coming. I think what surprised me though is that every time there's been guidance issued by, or an enforcement action issued by the SEC, we now also have state actors. Massachusetts be, has become pretty active. Uh, Texas has also been active you would think that it would dampen or slow down the market, and it really hasn't. So I've been surprised that it almost has led to more phone calls, not just about, oh, are we in trouble, but more in the context of, okay, we really recognize we need lawyers, we need to, to try and do this right. Yeah. Um, but it ha the enthusiasm is still really there. I mean, it's So it's really validation in the fact that they're issuing guidance, in my opinion, but I think it brings the question of, man, I need, I need help on this thing. People are, yep. they've got to call in the pros. All right, the other thing that's interesting about these guidance, I'm going to get your reaction to is, 
has it really set the rules of the road yet? I mean, what I'm trying to look for is, what are the rules of the road? I mean, I, know how to, <laughs> I drive on the right side of the road here in the US, I stop at the stop sign, I can get through things with the rules. What's changing, what's stable? Obviously security tokens is solid, right? That's right. A, a good rule. Yeah. What rules of the road are developing? So I think, I, using your analogy, I would say that what the SEC has said, if you go over 20 miles an hour, probably more like 10 miles an hour, you're speeding, and that's <laughs> the securities. But we're not going to tell you if, if the floor is 10 miles an hour. So it may be that if you go two, three, five miles an hour, we're also going to give you a ticket. And that's sort of the environment we're in. So there's, we know where there's the danger zone, where you've crossed that line. What we don't know is where is the safety zone. And so that, um, that I think in some ways is where that guidance has, has come. I think where that is pushing people though is, is more offshore. And I think that's always a risk. When I, you know, I, was, I was involved in digital currency several years ago with certain regulators. And, there was, and that's when I think the government was more interested in stamping it out. And there was, a, there was a huge offshore movement. You're seeing that with token sales now too, that companies that want to be in the US mm -hmm. um, are moving offshore. So hopefully we're, my goal and hope is that the, the, the regulators avoid that problem. I do think that it's, the regulators still are not looking to crush this industry. They're trying to regulate it. And I do think that's a big change. I'm not saying that there aren't going to be people it's hurt. It's better. It's better. Not great. Not They're great. They're not moving fast enough, basically, is the issue, right? Or. Yeah, I also think that companies, um, even the, the comp for a company that's going through that process, it's sort of still extraordinarily painful. <laughs> so um, I'm not saying in any way that the regulators are having a light touch, but yeah. I do think there is also a recognition here that yeah. we don't want to destroy this industry. And yeah. I think Congress, the same And way. you're doing a great job. You guys are pioneering a whole new class of law, documents, agreements are all being kind of recasted and reimagined with crypto. Daily. It's, it's daily. Well, well I, got to, I got to ask you the final question. Um, you know, as things progress, Things are happening. You got a lot more deals under your belt now. You guys are doing great over there at Goodwin. You're in the top uh, set of law firms doing crypto deals. So I got to ask you, what are you advising clients now? I mean, obviously you're trying to, you know, zig and zag at the right time based on guidance, make sure everyone's covered and the risk uh, reduction. But at the same time, you guys have also been, I won't say super aggressive, but you've balanced aggressiveness of opportunity recognition and capture with risk management. What's your current advice now? I think if, generally it is, really take a hard look at the securities token. If it, I think that that, I mean, it's not the, the perfect path for everybody, there's cost, ex expense, et cetera. But I think if you really want to do a, a token in the US, you want to be safe, I think you've really got to look hard at the, going down the securities token route. The other one is to go purely offshore and do the, pick a venue that is re relatively crypto friendly and do everything offshore, which means no US money, um, not even at the SAF stage early on, and also have the token go on, an ex if you're going to put it on an exchange, don't put it on an exchange that has US um, people buying and selling tokens. That is sort of the, the, sort of the two <laughs> paradigms that we're seeing. I think anything in, the, anything in the middle, then we're advising, all right, let's, let's talk about pure utility token here, where I mentioned it before, where the token stays, doesn't go outside the platform, or where you've put a set of fixed price on the token, or you, where if you do create some type of token, you do a passive bulletin board. Um, those are models to still to be explored. I don't think many companies are doing them, but those yeah. are those are sort of the paths. I think the the utility token that we've been seeing over the last six months is a, now is a pretty difficult path to go. And the offshore thing, Kelsey uh, Lemister, who is on tax partner at your firm, was just uh, talking with me about, you know, might not be the best thing you, with the tax reform in the U.S. Yeah. So, so what's your what's your state now on that? Are you still advising offshore? It kind, of, or it kind of depends now, uh, based upon decision making on whether you're security or not. Yeah, so for, with Kelsey, he's talking about tax issues, and historically with these, these tokens, the tax issues were very significant, and there was a push to go offshore for those reasons. From a, and, then, and then there was also always a push about whether you go offshore for the regulatory reasons, we're not going to touch the U.S. I think those, those are both things that companies have to figure out and intersect. Mm -hmm. So we had companies that ultimately decided not to go offshore because the tax, tax advantages were not that significant. Maybe they'd lost a lot of money during the course of their three or four years. And so they decided we can, we can offset those gains. Also there's aggravation with going offshore. And so you have to build that in, getting money back from the Cayman Islands or elsewhere, there's a process versus just you know, going to B of A down the street. So yeah. I, think, I think it's, it's all these things that you have to counterbalance. Yeah. And, and, and like we mentioned, it's, it's just everything's changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so it literally is like a day by day assessment of what's the next yeah. path. 
it's like the big set of waves coming in. It's really awesome. Final comment I'd like to get, uh, I'm looking at a hedge fund, fund of funds deck uh, from a cryptocurrency fund of funds. So now you're seeing funds of funds and funds and hedge funds. So a couple bullet points I want to get your reaction to. New investable asset class, uncorrelated with others, value creation at massive scale, nascent markets with liquidity, unlike VC. Inefficiency provides opportunity. Those are the kind of the main bullets on the first page. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I think so, my reaction is No regulation, <laughs> regulatory concerns, we got tax. Boy, it sounds great, I should jump right in. And just, and, and. So, the, I mean, obviously the cryptocurrencies have <laughs> skyrocketed. I mean, we've had a kind of a, a pull back a little bit the last week or so, but some of them are back up yeah. today. So I think it is, there is a lot of opportunity. I think some of the opportunity they're talking about, so we represent a number of hedge funds and others who create kind of financial products with this. Some of the opportunities, you look at the stock market. The stock market now is really hard to basically game the market in the sense of not cheating, but like doing arbitrage where if you go to one exchange mm -hmm. and buy the stock from there and sell it in another, that type of thing. Really hard to make money. There's a lot of sophisticated players, a lot of technology. You're talking at literally, I mean, what was that movie about where they were able to do a trade like a millisecond faster <laughs> and it gave them an advantage? That's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Here in the crypto space, you don't have that sophistication yet. So I, there are companies who are figuring out ways to buy and sell currency in the same currency and make money in that transaction. Yeah. Maybe they buy from one exchange at a dollar and it's selling at a dollar twenty at the other exchange, yeah. so they sell it. So I think there is a lot of opportunity. Ultimately, these are being regulated. Even the cryptocurrencies are regulated. Some, some are regulated by FinCEN. The exchanges yeah. are regulated by FinCEN. So there's regulation, but there's a lot of opportunity. A lot it. of arbitrage, certainly. Yep. Big so, time. Yep, so it's a, it's a really fascinating market. Very sophisticated market. Again, eyes wide open if you go in and invest. And, in and this is really talks about the makeup of the personality of the people involved. If you can, can handle the wave, you should get out there. Hence the reaction to some people look at it a little bit nervous. They're the risk averse folks. Yeah. You got to be, <laughs> you have to have a stomach for this. You know. You do. <laughs> you also have to be smart. Like yeah. you shouldn't put all your money in it. You shouldn't pull out your 401k yeah. money to start investing in yeah. any asset class. You have to invest enough that you can lose. If you lose it, it's not going to be life changing. Well, a lot of smart people that I know, and I know that a lot of people who are really into this and see great opportunities. Certainly there's the, the bad actors in there, but I love this opportunity. I think it's a once in a generation movement. I think it's a, the biggest wave that's hit. Since, since many generations, so uh, really awesome. Congratulations on the work um, you're doing. Any new update on Goodwin, Goodwin Front? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's just been a fascinating time for us, and um, it has, we've got a ton of people doing a lot of interesting stuff, and literally every day we hear a new project, we're like, wow, that's a really interesting application of this technology, or a different use case. And our clients are coming to us, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of Silicon Valley and that model, is we learn things from our clients when we yeah. meet with them, so we love having those meetings, and. Um, I think you're just going to see tremendous change, even really, literally week to week. How's session. your VC client base? They're probably um, engaged heavily at this point. I'm hearing a lot of folks on the VC side, you know, not like feeling like they're being left out, but they're <laughs> seeing this as a new way. I, I would certainly have been called out here in the hedge fund, unlike VC. I mean, classic venture capital's been around is, for a while. It's a new paradigm for them. I think they're grasping with it. I think that in some ways it's attractive to them because it does provide for their LPs, it provides much greater liquidity than a typical VC investment, which is a five to 10 year wait. But, but they're also, uh, people are saying that they're being replaced and they're having issues where, where um, companies no longer want to go to VC. They're saying, why, yeah. why should I give up equity and control when I can get the money for you know through different means. So yeah. I think it's it is disrupting their world. I think they're yeah. slowly not slowly they move pretty quickly. They're adapting to it. I think that there's tremendous value to having VCs involved in the ecosystem. I mean they should do it. I mean they should take a little bit of of the of their fund because I mean just the opportunity to, to get appreciation and again liquidity in an unregulated market is an opportunity. It is an opportunity. And they they're they're in it. They're exploring <laughs> it and stuff. But it's Grand Fondo partner at Goodwin. Check out Goodwin, a great firm on the ICO front. They're in the top uh, in Silicon Valley and around the world. They got great tax uh, law. Grant, good friend of theCUBE. Thanks for coming on again, appreciate uh, your commentary and update on the ICO playbook. I'm John Furrier, this is CUBE Conversation. Thanks for watching.